Wagmer. Good morning. This is pretty cool. This is an SRO room for education as it pertains to Detroit. That's very cool. Good morning and welcome. Um, the, the name of this session is Choice is Ours, and it's all about education. Um, we, uh, if you can try and find empty chairs, there's some chairs in the front, actually. There's one here at this table. There's another at that table. Um, try and find your seat, get your refreshments, and uh, we're going to begin the program. Um, we're, gonna, we're talking this morning about all the different uh, remedies and agendas for educating children, uh, not just in Detroit, but, but statewide. Um, as you may know, uh, recently another new study came out and said that actually Michigan had lost ground uh, from 13th to 45th, I believe, nationally since 2003. So this is not, education problems are not just a Detroit problem, it is a state of Michigan problem, and we're going to be talking about that this morning. Um, to uh, just a couple of housekeeping things, everyone has question cards, green quest question cards on your table, and that is how we will be doing questions this morning. So if you have a question you want to ask of the, uh, any of the speakers on the panel, please um, write it on the card, raise the card, and they'll bring it to the stage. Um, to start off the program, I'd, uh, I'd like to introduce Tanya Allen, the CEO of the Skillman Foundation. Full disclosure, I'm a member of, of the Board of Trustees of the Skillman Foundation, so that's probably one of the reasons I'm here this morning. Um, we also will be joined by Sandy Baruja, hopefully later, who runs the chamber and also was part of the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children that, that Tanya was a co-chair of. You're going to be hearing more about that in a moment. And John Ricolta will also be um, uh, speaking this morning. John was also a member of the Coalition and uh, so we're going to hear his thoughts on not just the coalition's recommendations, but where do we go from here. But to begin, let's have Tanya kind of set the stage, and I know she has a uh, video that she wants to show as well. But to help everybody who is going to be speaking, I just would love to get a sense of the, of the room in terms of how many are here because they are focused on traditional K-12 public education. That's your passion. How about charter schools? How many are here because they, and they are some of the same people. This is so, this is what's so interesting. How many here are in higher ed? Okay, for-profit organizations, non-profit organizations, interesting. Okay, with that, let me welcome to the stage Tanya Allen, who will give you kind of the lay of the land for this morning. So first I'd like to say thank you, Mary. Yes. <laughs> would like to say thank you all for coming, um, for being really smart and engaged citizens. And I also want to just say you're also very good looking. This is a good looking group, don't you think, Doug? They are. <laughs> oh, flatterer. Yeah, She's flatter. a flatterer. Flatter them up Espe you get especially into. the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I would say to set the stage, is that I think that as a city, as a state, we've done some really important and powerful things in the last couple of years. So when you think about the bankruptcy, um, I often think about the bankruptcy as a shared memory for our community that we can do something really tough and succeed. And I think that this is the time for us to take that shared memory and move it into other tough issues. And the toughest issue facing us and has been facing us for generations has been education. And so in order for us to solve education, we gotta do three things. We gotta flex our civic muscle, we have to have political courage. And then I think the third is we have to face the brutal truth. And so I'm gonna start with the brutal truth and then I'll go back to um, political coverage, courage and then go to civic muscle. The, the brutal truth is this. We have a hundreds, thousands of great educators in our city that are working really hard to educate our children but they're working hard and their work is not turning into success. So in the city of Detroit, there are only five schools that beat the state average in reading and seven schools that beat the state average in math. So we have plenty of choice within that system. Uh, we have EAA, we have DPS, uh, and we have charter schools. 
And so this is not about pointing the finger at any of those systems, but just recognizing that none of the systems in a collective way is doing a good job. And I often say, if you have crummy choice, that's no choice at all. And we gotta figure out how we create more high quality choice for our children. Uh, the second thing I would say is that what is happening in Detroit is not just a Detroit problem. As much as we want to point our fingers and say those Detroiters don't know what they're doing, um, most of the things that are happening in Detroit around education are pretty much led by the state. Uh, and so I don't, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't suggest you know, that Governor Engler did this for that reason. Governor Granholm or even Governor Snyder. I think they all had a good and um, good interest in trying to fix the problems in Detroit. But the challenge is they have had very little success too. So now we have to figure out what's the path forward because the status quo is not strong enough for us. And then the last thing is that when we look at, and Mary quoted these numbers about going from the 13th to the 45th in the nation. And if you look at African American students, 26 or 27 to the 47th in the nation. And this has all happened, quite honestly, over a 10 year period. So the slide is rapid and it is um, dangerous for us as a state. And in truth, the brutal truth of this is that when we look at ourselves in the next 10 years, people are gonna be looking and thinking about what did we do as the civic leadership in this state, in our community. And so as a result of that, I think that we have to, knowing this truth, knowing these facts, we have to push um, our political leaders to be courageous. And I have to say, I think that the governor is being very courageous around these issues. I think that the mayor is being extraordinarily courageous. Now we have to push our legislature to be extraordinarily courageous, because this is a time for extraordinary leadership. We don't just need politicians. This is really about the strength and the vitality of our state. And then lastly, we have to stretch our civic muscle. And I think that the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children has done just that. And we'll <coughs> show a video of that in just one second. It's really about bringing together people who have disparate voices, um, who have different ideologies from different worldviews, different viewpoints, and wrestling with the toughest issue that you can, because there is nothing more political than education, wrestling with that issue to come up with a set of solutions that benefits all, that creates a level playing field for all schools. And that's essentially what the coalition work is about. And so we have a um, video that describes that to give you some sense of the work. My plans after high school is going to college, get a major in business. I really want to go to Berkeley or Santa Fe School of Music. I plan to go to college at University of Michigan or Michigan State. I want to be a psychologist, be recognized for my good work. We're trying as hard as we can to, you know, compete with worldwide schools, and we really do want an, a good education. Join the coalition, because personally, if we don't get it right with the kids, we're never going to reach our destination as a city. I joined the coalition to actually, to hope to provide a better way or path for children to receive a, a, a better quality education, which I think is their civil right. I joined to make sure that the Detroit public school story was told and it was accurate. I'm a classroom teacher at Dawson Elementary Middle School in Detroit Public Schools. You have principals, you have teachers, you have um, business leaders. The whole idea of taking 36 different people from different backgrounds who barely know each other and putting them in a room and giving them three, four months to come up with a document that is going to uh, essentially solve world peace, uh, do something that's just very complex and very difficult uh, was, is a, a major task, not easy. This can't be just nibbling around the edges. We've seen that for too long, I think, in Detroit and a lot of school districts. So it has to be really bold. It has not all been unicorns and glitter either. <laughs> Grueling. Productive, though. Long, hard, <laughs> painful. Uh, but, you know, at the end, hopefully uh, meaningful. The joke on the academic subcommittee, I have another co-chair, Clark Durant. At, towards the end of the meeting, everything we have been 
almost falling in step with, whereas at the beginning, we were completely on different sides of the planet. I mean, we don't have a perfect agreement, like, let's be clear, but we found some common ground. It's been an enormous commitment of time with a lot of very dedicated people trying to work through very thorny issues. Difficult conversation, research, uh, conversation with folks in other cities about what they're doing, uh, wrestling with these problems. It has been draining. It has been challenging. We have had many Eurekas. When we started, there were some very heated exchanges from people who we knew were not in agreement with one another. But over the course of the dialogue, working together, uh, that attitude, that difference has changed. Surprising in the process for me has been uh, working with people who don't come from where I come from, who have different views, who don't look like me, that I don't normally associate with, and getting to hear the perspectives of other folks from other sides of the table and surprisingly understanding their point of view. Some of the people that you would think would have opposing viewpoints, I've actually found that we have very similar ones. Surprisingly, I've been able to uh, have some impact in the process. I really didn't think I would uh, change any minds or get people to see uh, my point of view. You might make some assumptions about people, but then you realize they're, they have the same care about the children, so that's really hopeful is refreshing that we have come together to a point where we're saying, yes, we all, we're all on the same page about so many issues. The work has been done honestly, directly, and um, with, with true heart. For me, as a parent to be involved in things like this shows something. I enjoyed the fact that we began the discussion with guiding ethics and values, um, especially around the idea that we should all be here for children, chiefly. We all believe in the children. This work is very authentic. It came from the hearts of people who care about students in the city of Detroit. Not just DPS students, not just EAA students, not charter students, but all students. People were not there grandstanding, people were not there for their own benefit, just no one was getting anything out of it. Uh, people really do care. I do, I read, uh, that, that is my passion. And, uh, and uh, I know the only way that we can uh, lift uh, our, the children, um, Detroit children, out of poverty is through uh, education. We live in a society with people with different interests, so we shouldn't expect 100% alignment, but we're pretty damn close. I think the recommendations are really strong. Uh, I think we're getting to some good stuff. I, there's a, you know, the nature of these kinds of efforts is that you, you're never happy with everything, um, but there are recommendations um, in this group that I think everybody should be really pleased by. I'm hopeful that we come up with a close to consensus, pretty coherent and exciting set of recommendations that we can make to the governor and to the state uh, that have appeal to the local community, that makes sense to teachers and educators and people who are involved in education. I am hopeful that people in Lansing, in our city, in our schools, in our community, Realize these bold recommendations will make some people uncomfortable, but change often does. As a community activist, a lot of people believe that the important thing is to fight, and I believe that the most important thing is to build. Those of us that are engaged in education, those of us that invest, those of us that employ the students that we produce, have come up with something we think will work, or at least move us forward, so that we don't continue to fail the students in Detroit. back to Mary, I want to just make sure that you know you have the choices ours, our recommendations on the table. And I also wanted to take a moment to ask all of the coalition members who are in the room if they wouldn't mind standing. Uh, it was a brutal hundred days, I would say. <laughs> it wasn't, well, maybe it was as bad as they said it was. <laughs> to 
two things about the video. One is, how many people like John Carroll's job title, the <laughs> VP of miscellaneous <laughs> stuff? That's what I think my job is most days, and I'm sure some of yours as well. And the second thing is, the amazing uh, transformation of people, what they said over and over again, was sitting down with people with very wildly disparate views and coming together and figure, not agreeing on every single thing, but coming to respect each other and working together, that's part of that, uh, what did you call it, civic muscle, I think, Tanya. And, um, and I think it's, it's, it's something that we, we can observe that it's really hard to demonize somebody that you just had breakfast with last week. You know, if you get to know people as people instead of just as platitudes and as ideologies, interesting things can happen. And to that, um, and that's kind of an intro to our next speaker. John Ricolta was a member of the coalition. He's the CEO of Wallbridge. Many of us know him for that, one of the largest construction companies in Michigan, if not the largest. And he also is very involved in, in civic groups, business leaders for Michigan, New Detroit, longtime chair of that. And someone who has spoken here at Mackinac and in other forums about the need for coherence. And that is one of the one of the things that we have so often lacked as a region and as a state. So I'd like John um, to have the opportunity now to make some opening remarks and then we'll get to Sandy and then we'll open it up for discussion. John? Well, good morning and thank you very much. If you knew what I knew or I've learned in the last hundred days, you would be appalled, outraged, angry, and you'd be questioning yourself, isn't our society bankrupt itself? Over the last 15 years, the Detroit public school system has gone from 180,000 students to 45,000. It's outrageous. We have had evidence for those 15 years that the public school system in the city of Detroit is bankrupt. That bankruptcy extends to academics. How much more proof do we need that we're failing our children the average ACT score is 15.9. You need 21 just to get into college. Does anybody know what score you would get if you just guessed at every question? 13. Only 6 to 10 percent of the students are proficient. I had no idea what proficiency meant when I went there. I'm not an academician. I know very little about education. I'm a businessman, but I do know that it doesn't take very long to analyze the data and to come up to a conclusion, and we are in a crisis of a very, very large proportion. We don't have academics in Detroit. These children are not able to go on to trade school. They're not able to hold a job. They're not able to go on to college. And for every one of these kids that get out of the system, I don't want to use the word graduate, cost society a million dollars during their lifetime. And 4,000 of these students leave every single year. 4,000 times a million, some number like $4 billion a year we're costing our society and we can't find the money to get the school system out of debt. Let's go on to governance. There's 250 schools in the city of Detroit. There's no overall governance. You can open when you want, close when you want. We have 17,000 empty seats in DPS alone in the Central Business District, and yet we're short thousands in the outlying areas. We need to have some overall control as to how we place schools in the city of Detroit. Now to go to my expertise, finance. The Detroit public school system is bankrupt, totally bankrupt. The state, under the state control, we have run up a deficit in 15 years of $850 million. $850 million. And the way they're paying for it today is they're taking $53 million a year out of the kids' education. And that's just the beginning. The legacy costs are overwhelming, are over $5,000 a year per student that bring no value whatsoever to their education. Retirement, administrators, the system's too large. And yet we all sit back and we're doing nothing. So, I don't really have much more to say other than we have, 
We have a crisis on our hands, and we ought to not be talking about anymore the fact that we have a crisis. What we need to engage in is what's the fix. And that's where we're getting the resistance. Everybody has an excuse as to why we can't do something. Right now, today, there is a letter floating around in Lansing to fund another $100 million worth of debt. That $53 million that's coming out of the kids' education today is going to go to $63 million in September. The system's another $100 million in debt. And it's more important to have roads, which it is. But we're killing ourselves as a state. We've gone from 15th, 14th, 16th, whatever number you want to choose, into the 40s. We're becoming the Mississippi of the North. How are we going to attract these high-tech jobs when we don't have the people that can fill them? They say there's 65,000 high-tech jobs in, in Michigan today unfilled. And it's just not Detroit's problem. If you look at these, I have a statistic here. I'm going to read this to you. I knew this. They wanted me to say it. Since 2003, Michigan white students' achievements, relative rank, these are just the white kids, has fallen from 13th to 45th in the nation in fourth grade learning, which is the most important statistic coming out. That's the marker from going forward. 13th to 45th. Sandy? <laughs> so this is exactly what it was like during the coalition <laughs> meetings. John would give this amazing speech, right, Clark? Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> and then he'd literally drop the microphone and walk off the stage, and the rest of us would be kind of going like, what? <laughs> You'd think as the organizer of this event, I would know better than to follow you. <laughs> Man, I, I clearly, I'm doing something wrong. All right. Uh, in an attempt to follow John, uh, let me also do a couple things. First of all, let me thank uh, my fellow coalition members, uh, many of them who are in the room, for, uh, for an amazing experience. And uh, the person who really needs to be thanked here for this truly amazing piece of work is Tanya Allen and her team. So most people, uh, even frankly those who served on the coalition, really didn't know the story. And uh, the story is quite remarkable. So the governor at the beginning of the year, beginning of the calendar year, said, I'm going to tackle the educational challenge in Detroit. And he was committed to tackling that challenge the same way he f tackled the financial challenge <coughs> of the city of Detroit and was getting ready to take bold action. Tanya went to the governor and said, would you be willing to hold off for a little bit while we put together a broad-based coalition to examine this issue? And Tanya talked to the governor into waiting, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. And the governor said, fine, you have 100 days. <laughs> 100 days to answer the question what to do with education in the city of Detroit. Not just DPS, but education in Detroit. And it was Tawny and her team at Skillman that brought this group together. And it was just one of the most amazing acts of leadership I've seen in my five years uh, in Michigan. So Tawny, congratulations and, 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 and thank you. Uh, as the video showed, I think, very well, there was something in the report that you have at your chairs for everyone to like. There's also something in the report for everyone to dislike. And there are equal measures of both. And I can tell you as uh, someone, everyone walked in with their own personal political biases, uh, experience biases, uh, opinions of DPS, opinions of charter schools, you name it. Uh, it was amazing how collaborative these sessions were. And one of the things that, you know, someone who spent most of their career in Washington, and I'm old enough to remember the days in Washington where Democrats and Republicans actually used to talk to each other. 
And why did they, why was it, you know, that way back in the 70s and 80s? It was because they used to go drinking together. They used to have breakfast together. Uh, they used to play poker together. They don't do that anymore now, and all they do now is they yell at each other. And so the diversity of opinion that was in that room, people who I never thought I would find any common ground with on anything, uh, I actually ended up uh, developing a great deal of respect for. John hit on the most important theme of the report, and I think just because of the fact that there's so much in the report, it doesn't always rise to the top in terms of uh, what people talk about the report. People are talking about the governance issues, people are talking about the financial issues, uh, because they're so broad, they're so vast, but really the most important issue is educational attainment, by far, and John just hit on that. A couple things. First of all, economic societal mobility in this country and in this state, and particularly in the city of Detroit, is now broken. It's not bent, it's not sprained, it is broken. The United States is now at European levels of social immobility. That means if you are born rich in this country, or if you're born poor in this country, that is how you are going to die. The ladder from poverty into the middle class and beyond was education. This country, the state, and the city no longer has that ladder functioning. The rungs are broken. So all of these issues that everyone is focused on that are interesting, fascinating, filled with political intrigue, governance and finance, are all the adult issues. At the end of the day, they don't matter a damn. They really don't until we fix as a society our ability to educate our kids in a way that is world class that this nation and the city of Detroit used to do. So if we want, as John said, to avoid spending billions of dollars a year in corrections and public assistance and other societal ills, we have to fix the challenge of ensuring that our kids, no matter where they're being educated and what their socioeconomic class is, is getting great education. John charted the trajectory of our educational attainment, going from top 10 to, to bottom 10. Well, there's another number that you can look at that I think is even more powerful. If you want to know what a society's income levels are going to be, what someone's socioeconomic status is going to be, draw a direct line do not pass go, do not collect $200, draw a straight line to educational achievement. And as this state has faltered in educational achievement, our per capita income has dropped in lockstep with that decrease. So yes, it is really interesting to figure out how we're gonna dig ourselves out of 800 million dollars of debt just for DPS. Yes, it's very interesting to figure out how we're going to handle the governance issues between you know, how schools open and how schools close. Yes, it's interesting political intrigue of you know, charters versus DPS. At the end of the day, those are just interesting questions. The real question is, how do we achieve economic, uh, educational excellence so people can achieve economic independence. Okay, so now we're gonna open it up for a, a discussion, and if you have a question, remember the cards are on your table, raise your uh, hand with the, uh, your written question and they'll, uh, they'll come up, but let me start with this. Okay, the coalition has its recommendations and we have those on the table. Um, the governor has his uh, agenda that he laid out as well. The Education Trust came out with some, something recently, Everybody's got some remedies. What are the common commonalities of all those different plans? What could we act on this year? What are the common things that we can all agree on and move forward? 
Well, I think one of the things that we all agree on is the Detroit Education Commission, which would be a new entity that would provide, um, it's almost like a baseball commissioner. Um, air traffic controller. Air traffic controller. Uh, but it's a person or entity that does not have any bias in it, that serves as the kind of gatekeeper, opening and closing of schools, holding all schools to the same standard. And I think that's an important issue. And we have to make sure that if you're a charter, you're an EAA, or you're DPS, that if you're a low performing school, you cannot continue to operate. You actually, you either have to close or we're gonna, you're gonna be able to open schools based on performance, not just because you can um, as a district or that you have charters or et cetera. Um, and then I think, uh, and one of the things that is different, and I think in our recommendations related to the DEC is that the coalition has recommended that that entity be appointed by the mayor. Um, the governor has indicated that he wants some uh, role, not just role, a controlling interest in that entity. And I think it's important, I'm lifting this up, not because I think um, governance should trump academics, but at some point, at some point, Detroit has to stop wearing the scarlet letter. I mean, we, if we're gonna be held accountable, you know, we wear the scarlet letter because we're held accountable for what's happening in schools, yet we don't have control. So I think we're gonna have to have some local control on this. It has to be at a municipal level. We need to be able to see the whole entire picture because there are so many different entities and interests who are in that landscape. And so I think that is something that we can do immediately. I think we can do common enrollment attached to that, and I think that we need to start tackling this question of transportation. Anyone else? Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, follow him, thank you. <laughs> friend of yours, Tanya? <laughs> the, the stability of the system today is so fragile. When you consider the decline in both the population of the city of Detroit and the number of students just have left the entire city because of this population decline. We've gone from 180,000 total students to about 120,000 in 10 years. That's part of the story. But a bigger part of the story is when it was at 180,000, the DPS had 85% market share. They had about 160,000 students in the system. Today, there are only 45,000 students left in DPS. So we've had a decline in DPS of 120,000 students. Multiply that times $14,500 per student, and you get the enormity of the lack of revenue that this system's had to deal with over the past 10 to 15 years. And so you can look at this decline in another way. We lost 120,000 students out of DPS. Let's, let's narrow that down to 100,000 for errors and maybe a little bit of misjudgment. And we've had deficits of 850 million over that period of time. In essence, what they're saying, or what I'm saying, is it's cost about $8,500 for every student that's left the system. We still have 40,000 to go. And many of those numbers were 2003, 2004, 2005 numbers. It won't be $8,500 to get rid of students anymore like we have. It'll be 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. That'll be the cost of society to downgrade the system. Multiply 10,000 times 10,000 uh, 10, times 40,000 students. The state is facing another half a billion dollar deficit if it does nothing. And when you go up to Lansing and you meet with these people, and we have, and they sit there, and they said, honestly, I won't name, said, the state's been in control. You have a constitutional responsibility to educate these kids. How can you not take responsibility for the last 15 years? And here's what, the, I was waiting for this answer. I stayed up all night trying to figure out what would somebody say? <laughs> and here's what they said. It's not our fault. It would have happened anyways. This is what our legislators and our leaders are saying to us. It would have happened anyways, even though you have the constitutional responsibility. Everybody's got to walk out of this room committed, whether you're in favor of charter schools or DPS or whatever it might be. This has to be the number one issue of our state going forward. In my view, and I'm a contractor and I love to build roads, it's more important than roads. 
And to the Republicans that are in this room, I'm not interested in a tax cut for myself. And I think a large portion of the middle class isn't interested in a tax cut either. We're interested in saving our state. Sandy, um, last year when, the, uh, when, when we met, I, it wasn't really a, 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 a goal coming out of the um, Mackinac Conference, but I know that education reform is one of the legislative priorities for the chamber. Where, what do you see? Do you see, you hear and see the same things that John is hearing when he talks about the legislature? Because it sounds like that's where everything will rest right now about changing in Detroit. So what do you mean legislative reform? Well, legislative, mean? how the legislature views DPS or views education in Detroit, the coalition's recommendations versus the governor's, any kind of action going forward. It seems like a lot depends on how the legislature views this, will they uh, gotcha. take responsibility for the debt, will they, um, if, if, I don't know if legislation is required to create an education commission in Detroit? Yes. Yes, it does. So how, how are you, because you have a big lobbying effort, you have a lobbying operation in Detroit, how do you see it? So it, it is a tough sell. Uh, uh, again, John, uh, John described it well. Uh, you know, we have a, uh, and I'm a Republican, uh, I'm fiscally conservative, so I understand uh, where the Republican legislature, Republican-led legislature is coming from. Uh, the question is, can we make the case that we're better off in the long run in terms of our state's financial health and the health of our society by taking care of these problems now as opposed to just kind of nibbling at the edges now? Because that is kind of the approach that we've been taking on, well, frankly, everything in this state, you know, roads in particular, education in particular, uh, we've been kind of nibbling around the edges as opposed to solving the problem. And if we can get past that discussion, I think we'll be fine. But it is going to be a, a heavy lift. There's no, there's no question about it. The other thing I'll say is that, you know, for anyone, and I, I don't quite understand anyone who's in either elected office or in the media or anyone who's kind of in this public space who is, uh, who has, who has tried to position the coalition's recommendations and the a little bit more recent recommendations from the governor as really far apart. They're really not. I mean, when you look at just about every key issue, there is a good deal of common ground. So it's really hard for someone to like one and really dislike the other. I mean, case in point, the Detroit Education Commission that Tanya mentioned, everyone agrees on some sort of structure that would serve the purpose of the Detroit Education Commission. There's some quibbling over, you know, how it's structured and who's on it, but that's, that can take, be, take, take care of negotiation. Even the, uh, the, 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 the kind of the block bluster recommendation that the state assume the debt that they have legal responsibility for, okay, let that sink in for a second. Uh, <laughs> You know, even the governor has kind of said that, yes, there needs to be some, uh, at least some state assistance on that. Um, so even there, there's, there's some, some grounds for common, uh, for, for alignment. And everyone agrees with the increased educational standards, not just in Detroit, but across uh, the educational landscape uh, in, in Michigan. So there's a lot of common ground there. And I think if we focus on the areas, and I think I really liked your question, Mary, uh, that you began with is that what are the co areas of com commonality and there's a lot of them. Well yeah one of the questions from just to underscore that this is from the audience legislators typically do not find their way to action when there are conflicting plans before them so being able to sift through and come up with the the best of from the coalition and the best of from the governor's plan could could that is, I, I are there actually conversations to get that going? Just yeah. really quickly, people, people who are trying to make a bigger gulf between the two plans are looking for an excuse not to act. Okay. Yeah, and I think that, um, so I am encouraged because I said that political leadership is key. 
So Mayor Duggan is uh, actively thinking about this, working on this issue, and <clears throat> those of you who know the mayor, anytime he's actively thinking about working on something, you better get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think the other thing is, is that the governor has put a ton of time and energy in this, and we're pushing towards, I mean, we're gonna get to a common agreement, a common set of plans before us, but I think what we have to do is we have to push political courage. We have to make sure that neither of those two gentlemen or anyone in the legislature starts falling back on things, on excuses like a Detroit fatigue or a Michigan fatigue. I'm like, how do you have fatigue for the largest city <laughs> in the state? How do you have fatigue for the state issues? I mean, that is your sole job, is governance. <laughs> is uh, governance and government. We have to make sure that people know this is the time for us to fix this. This is, you know, I talk about this all the time. This is winnable. We can win this. We have a set of recommendations that can help solve this, that not just solves what's going on in Detroit, but looks at these issues across the state. You know, John talked about the, what it's costing us as a state um, to see DPS erode. Well, quite honestly, it's costing us that as a state to see almost every district in this state erode. They all are shrinking, except for a small handful of them, and we're adding more supply to that. And it's nothing wrong with having choice. We want to have school choice, and our plan actually promotes it. The choice is ours. But at some point, we have to think through what do we want our education system to look like, and we have to put in the right measures and the right protections that will actually drive us towards high performance. And right now, we have air incoherence at the state level, at the legislature level, um, at the state board level, and that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. I'm a fiscally responsible Democrat, and that's unacceptable to me. <laughs> So, John, you were pretty uh, uh, adamant about the idea of the uh, education attainment, you know, and that, that it was a disgrace. And so this question is, what are the strategies agreed upon in the coalition's plan, and this could be for anybody on, on the panel, that directly um, improve or speak to student achievement? Rather than governance, rather than finance, what are the things that directly speak to student achievement? Anybody? I'd like Tanya to go first on that. Oh, She's sure. much better at this than I am. Uh, <laughs> so I'm happy to. So one of the biggest things that we've had in our plan, and one of the biggest things that we heard from educators is that there is no um, consistency. There is, we don't know what a good school looks like. You change the rules every time uh, you put out test results, et cetera. So the first thing we did as a coalition was to define what a good school is. And so there are things like we want to have a year's worth of growth every year academically for 100% of the students. There is attendance measures in there. There are different things about what we expect around schools. We're also asking that when we look at our population in the city of Detroit, we know we need to have 150 great schools, and we think we can do that over 15 years. And the way that we're going to have be able to do that is basically we're going to have to figure out how to prune our education environment. We're going to have to get some of the old schools out, we're going to have to, um, the low performing schools, we have to attract new schools, and we have to create fiscal stability for many of these schools so that they can actually be successful. Um, and so, and then the last thing that we talk about is giving educators the responsibility to lead in their school buildings. So that's one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing, is that educators are not the leaders of their school buildings. When you have cuts that are happening in the middle of the year, where finances are influencing whether or not you keep a teacher in a classroom in August, I mean in October, that's a ridiculous conversation. So any of us who run businesses, be they for profit or not, um, you know that you cannot have that level of instability. So that, those are the measures that we're trying to do. Give that accountability there, make sure that people are engaged in um, strong curriculum. And then we also promote things that are connecting um, what we're doing in the classroom in these schools to what the career trajectory is. So making sure that career tech education is there, making sure that we have stronger special education, um, and that these things are aligned with what's happening curricularly in the curriculum sense at the school level. I have, uh, and so this was okay. a, a topic of quite a bit of discussion at the uh, coalition. And we also brought up that there has to be a large component of parental accountability and student responsibility. The old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. 
applies here, and we have to find new tools and new ways to engage parents fully. And by the way, I can tell you that this is all anecdotal information. Every time we came across a parent, I was astonished at the concern and the interest level that they had in their kids. Being from the suburbs, you hear this narrative, you know, the parents don't care, and that's the cause. I never found that to be the case one time, and in fact, it's well publicized of this trip I went on with this charter school mother who decided to take her kids out of DPS and put them in charter schools. And the big problem with that is, is that there's no transportation. If you decide to go to charter school in the city of Detroit, you're on your own. And we didn't even mention it all, and this is a side note, 30,000 kids go to the suburbs to school. And they find their own way there. They go to the public schools in the suburbs. And that's another huge issue of the decline in the number of students in DPS. But back to the charter school mother. So I volunteered one day to go to school with them. And I'll make this short. I showed up at their doorstep at 6.15. We walked seven blocks to a bus. It was cold. I knew it was going to be cold. I was still cold. I was dressed in all my great football gear. It wasn't enough. <laughs> I stood at a bus stop for 30 minutes waiting for the bus. Got on the bus. The bus, to my surprise, Mayor Duggan, kudos to you. I was the only white guy on the bus, but other than that, <laughs> I felt safe. Everybody was courteous. The bus was clean. The bus was on time. But we only went three miles. We got off. And I said, okay, what's next? We've got to walk five more blocks. So I'm figuring we're going to a school. No, we go to another bus stop. We wait at that bus stop for another 30 minutes. By this time, I'm so cold, I pull out my iPhone, I'm looking for Uber to come and pick me up. <laughs> okay? No Uber. <laughs> we wait 30 minutes, we get on the bus, we go one mile. We get off the bus, we walk her one kid to school, four blocks, double back, eight blocks, and drop the daughter off. She do, we, 6.15 to uh, five minutes to eight. Took an hour 45 minutes to get those two kids to school. And this is what this mother endured every single day, there and back. Okay? And you can only imagine, I can only imagine what would happen if you had a common transportation system or Uber. got really invented, right. well, that's why I mentioned it, and had some kind of combined Uber where you could use the citizens of Detroit to take their kids to school in some kind of technology way. I'll bet you that the charter schools, if they could get that, you would empty out DPS today. Because the next thing I asked her on this trip, I said, why aren't you going to DPS? Is it the education is so much better at charter schools? And she said, quite the contrary. The academic education is about the same. I said, well, I'm confused. Why, why are you going through all of this agony when there's a good public school three blocks? She said, it's all about culture. It's all about the culture. It's about me, the parent, being respected. I can't get past the front door of DPS. It's about telling, not having to tell my children, don't go into the stairwells. It's about the bullying. It's about the crime. It's about when the school day ends at 3.30, the school day ends, and the charter schools, apparently, the school day extends. And so for all these charter school people who think that this coalition is anti-choice, we're anything but anti-choice. We're totally pro-choice. We want more charter schools, but we want it done in a way that it balances the system, and we want to challenge you, the charter school operators, to close the schools that are failing. This is the biggest complaint. There's a ton of charter schools that are open that don't deserve to be opened anymore. They're no better than the Detroit public schools. Yeah, let's remember Tanya's uh, remark about five schools in, this, in the city of Detroit meet the reading proficiency, or maybe it was John, yeah, and average. seven for math. That, right. That's out of 280 school buildings. Yeah. That's that, both. That is not acceptable. And we're challenging, the other thing I want to just say is we're not just challenging the charters to do it, we're challenging DPS to do it right. too. Right, Like So get, we give you a clean slate. We need to take the debt off of the slate not because DPS deserves it, but because the 47,000 children who go to DPS deserve a clean slate. So that's why it's, we're raising that. And then what we're saying to DPS is now you have to compete. 
Like really compete. You know what the landscape is now. You know what the standards are. This, if we're going to have this kind of marketplace, we're going to have, we want you to compete, but you got to compete with quality, not because of reputation or not because of history. So there's some, that, that's a good lead into several questions about finance and performance. Um, first, people are asking uh, in more than one question, that $800 million debt, how does that break down? Is that pensions, health care, capital buildings? No. Um, and also, and also uh, uh, what do you think about the potential for pay for success models to reward the schools that are performing in terms of, of academic achievement? Who would like to take? The, there's two questions there. I'll one the, is I'll take the first one. Okay. So the total debt of the system is $2 billion, roughly. 1.5 of its millage voted on by the voters, used to improve the schools itself. Think about it as capital improvement, build schools, repair schools. That leaves $500 million on the, uh, on the operating deficit. Normally schools don't have operating deficits. Detroit's case is different, has a huge one. Of that $800 million that was, a, that was deficits for this 15 years, in 2011, 2012, they floated two bond issues to get it off the short term into the long term. $450 million worth of debt. I believe that's paid down uh, to somewhere between 250 and 300. They're paying $53 million a year right out of the classroom. I kind of keep on, re keep on repeating that over and over and over again. This is not some money that's coming out of the lunch fund or the pension program. It's coming out of the classroom. $1,100 per student. And they're going to add $100 million in a couple of months. I believe it's going to take that number to $1,500 a student. And if the demographers are correct, and they have been in, uh, unbelievably accurate over the past uh, 15 years in predicting where the schools are going, we're going to lose at a minimum of 1,500 students per year for the next 10 years. So no, even if you create this wonderful school district, we're going to go from 45,000 to 30,000. And if this debt keeps on accumulating, pretty soon all the money in the classroom is going to go to pay the debt. Where do you cross that line where it's not effective? Well, I contend that that happened five years ago. So those are those two debts. Now let's go to the other debt, MIPSR. I don't know if you all know what this, I don't know what the acronym actually stands for, but it's the pension fund for state employees for teachers. It's $40 billion underfunded. That's statewide. Statewide. They take $2,000. Remember this $7,400 foundational grant that the state gives? Maybe it would be good if we just give you a little overview about finances in Detroit. $14,500 is about the total that they spend on every student. But that number is very misleading because you've got to take special ed out of that. That's about $150 million a year. And that is applied to about 8,000 students, 2,000 center-based, 6,000 in the classroom-based. That system alone loses $40 million a year. That gets the number down to about $11,000 per regular student. Now we start to deduct, and I'll pull my little sheet out here, 2,000 for MIPSR. 1,200 for debt. Um, building and maintenance, got a really badly sized system. 800 per student. Transportation costs too much, it's too big a city. 300. Restricted funding, 500. You're getting down to the point where you're not even investing in the kids anymore. And this is where we are today. So we have three challenges. We have the operating deficit. We have the MIPSERS, which applies to every district in the whole state of Michigan. And we have the huge legacy cost in DPS that's killing the system. We've got five minutes left. And Sandy, I'd like you to um, speak to trying to pull this together to, you know, you talked about the, the social impact, the social spending impact of doing nothing with, with uh, education in Detroit that we'll be spending billions more in other areas. How about the workforce issues that, you, that are very prevalent here at the, at the conference? Workforce, the, the workforce shortage from skilled trades uh, to advanced manufacturing is acute in Michigan. How, how can you tie this back to what we're talking about today in terms of workforce development and a future uh, for the city of Detroit? There's 70,000 open jobs in the state of Michigan right now. 
right now, 70,000 openings across the state. Why are they not filled? They're not filled because there are not enough people in this state with the skills to fill those jobs. If we filled them overnight, we would go from what we just achieved, thanks large, in large part to our governor, a state unemployment rate that now matches the national average. When's the last time that has happened in Michigan? It's been, what, 20 years, probably, since Michigan has been at the national average of unemployment. Now, the national average ain't no picnic. You know, the national average for unemployment is 5 point, what, 5.6, 5.5% right now. And that number is grossly, grossly underestimated once you start taking into account people who are underemployed, who are working part time. Uh, you know, we still have a huge education, I mean, uh, uh, employment challenge uh, in our nation. All of the jobs, all of the jobs that are going to be created, especially in areas that Michigan is going to have a competitive advantage, primarily next generation connected vehicle engineering, are high skill jobs. Not necessarily four year college degree jobs, although most of them will be, but a lot of them are skilled trades jobs. And as John said, even those who are quote unquote graduating out of DPS today, they're certainly not ready for college. They're not ready to succeed in community college. And they're not even prepared for any kind of skilled trades program. So what are they capable of? Well, based on the education they're getting today, they're, getting, they're capable of, well, entry level jobs. Well, OK, fix the problem by raising the minimum wage. That sounds good. But there aren't many minimum wage, le wage jobs left that aren't imminently, in today's technology world, able to be automated. There's literally no reason that you need a human being to make a hamburger at McDonald's today. In fact, in other countries, machines are making food. Quality, consistency, quality, um, speed. Okay. You still use people. Mm -hmm. I want to, um, we're coming to the end here, so I want to ask, this is uh, a question from the audience. And it kind of uh, goes back to where you started, Tanya, about the amazing, um, the amazing uh, coalition and, and, and how people came together for this effort. How can Detroit keep the energy used in the, and, the, and the goodwill of the education coalition and use the bankruptcy moment, what we learned from, the, from that, to blow up the rest of the system and start over again? Should we start over again. Should the Detroit public schools go into bankruptcy for the debt reasons that John outlined, and should we just start over again? Well, if you could I, each uh, please yeah. re respond to that. Well, I actually would love for the district to go into bankruptcy, but the state won't allow it. Why? Because they're contractually accountable for the yeah. debt. DPS, <laughs> so yeah, yeah DPS can't go into debt like the city can. Right. It's not it its own entity like that. It can't do that. But I think, um, you know, although, so I want to be clear, the coalition did not advance this, but I do think that what the governor's plan on the new co OCO is um, an option at creating essentially a bankruptcy state where you really can start anew. And I would say, you know, Darnell Early, who is the emergency manager at DPS, and he's over there in the room, uh, is working really hard at trying to build out what a new system would look like. But here's the thing. I think when many of us talk about let the, let the system go away, just let it go away, there are a couple things that we're forgetting. One is that there are 47,000 children in that system. We do not have the capacity to put those kids anyplace else. So we need to be able to support them. And I think if we do some of the right things, I think that you actually can curb uh, the, challenge, the, the erosion of the districts in terms of the attendance. The other thing is, is I think we have to give schools um, an even playing, ground, playing field. And I, the reason I just want to point this out, so. Uh, John, I have to tell you this about John too. Every time John goes on vacation, he comes back far more negative. <laughs> and then when he gets back in town for two weeks, then he's like, we can do it. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that I want to- Where do you up, go on vacation, John? <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, 
I'm like, John, come back to the right side. <laughs> um, but the point that I'm making around that, even though DPS is spending a lot of money, there are legacy costs that DPS has to carry because we now have a disaggregated school system. And we just have to understand that. And that is true for all schools, too. So as much as we complain about MIPSERS, the reason that MIPSERS is underperforming is because we don't have every teacher paying into it, because we allow charters not to. I'm not actually suggesting that we should do it. I'm just saying that's the truth of the, of the fact. And the other issue related to it is that if you don't think that you're paying for that, from across the state. Everybody is. The governor subsidized MIPSR every year in the budget. We're all paying for these systems that are old, that are legacy, that are accruing costs. And we have to, instead of just saying, like, it's broken, which we need to start over, it's just DPS. No, it is these broader contextual systems that are pushing at it. EAA has to spend about $1,000 in debt, covering the debt that's related to DPS. Everybody is paying the cost because we do not have a coherent plan to take us from where we were yesteryear into the future. And as a result of that, we're expending more money, more energy, trying to fix the system. Uh, and I, so my point around that all is, is that it's far more complicated than just letting the district go away. It's, and we also have to be more creative about thinking about how we fix this for kids um, and not just pointing the fingers. I think this blaming that we do in education just never gets us anywhere. And if you don't believe me, just look at the academic achievement of children. Sandy, so, uh, last uh, comments and then John. So uh, on this comment about you know, just, just, just shutting down the existing system. So that's only been done once in this country and that is New Orleans. And our organization has spent a tremendous amount of time looking at New Orleans, spending time in New Orleans, having people from uh, leaders of New Orleans spend time here. In fact, Mitch Landry was a, was a speaker here last year. So we knew New Orleans fairly well. Uh, uh, back in my federal official days, I actually worked in New Orleans uh, after, after Katrina. So it's a story I know well. When you talk to those who are really engaged in the educational upheaval, and I'll use that word very purposefully, that took place in New Orleans. When they shut down New Orleans public schools and replaced it with an all-charter system, they will tell you over a bourbon or in a quiet corner one very important thing. They were able to do that only under one circumstance. They killed the public school system when everyone wasn't looking. They were literally out of town. There was no one to protest. There was no one left to say no. And those who have been pushing that agenda took advantage of that opportunity while everyone was living in Oklahoma City and Houston. Now, I think the success story of New Orleans is real. I've looked at the numbers. I've talked to the people there. I've been in the schools. It is not nirvana. But in terms of where they were and where they are now, their educational achievement is infinitely higher by every measure. Now, there are those uh, who have certain educational interests that will poo-poo those numbers. I have yet to been able to prove any of those numbers uh, that are trying to poo-poo those numbers. The, the results are real. But I'll tell you, even today, in New Orleans, with their educational success, with the success of what they've done, there is still roughly 10% of the population in New Orleans who are banging on Mitch Landry's door every day wanting the old broken system back. That tells you the power of resistance to change. John, 30 seconds, summary, um, last minute. I'm not negative. <laughs> <laughs> Because he's no longer on vacation. Um, <laughs> I, by the way, I went to Venice, and you can really get negative coming out of Venice. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm so passionate about this is because I perceive that Lansing's not listening, especially the legislature. I agree with all the other panelists. The governor's plan and our plan, if we could just sit down, we could come to an agreement in a very short period of time and move forward. It's the legislature that we have to sell here. We're all going about our own way of doing it. And my frustration is about the legislature. And it's about my party. That's where my frustration is. And so that, when people deny responsibility, then you have to look backward and, say, and start placing blame. You caused it. You ran up the debt. 
You've had control of the system for 13 out of 15 years. And it's just not the Republicans. Jennifer Granholm and her administration and the Democratic controlled legislature had a big part of this too. It's all the politicians. And they have to stand up and be courageous and tackle this problem. Because if we don't, the outcome is far, far worse than it is if we do. If we have to spend four or five hundred million dollars fixing this, uh, letting DPS go bad, that doesn't account for all these kids that are going to come out of that system over the next several years that are going to be unqualified. And so if you hear a negativity, Tana, it's only about the frustration. I am very optimistic that when everybody leaves here today, you're going to at least know the magnitude of the problem. And I encourage other groups to come up with a plan. It's 100, 100, with more than 100 days. How many days are we now? 150 days. There's only been two real plans, two real comprehensive plans, the governor's and ours. Where's everybody else's plan? It's easy to poke fingers at ours. We don't think ours is perfect. We know that we had to compromise to get it done, but it's a starting place to have a dialogue. And this dialogue has to have a groundswell throughout the entire state. Whites, blacks, Republicans, Democrats, suburbanites, city dwellers, businessmen, unions. This is where we're going to show whether we have the cohesiveness and the guts to have a solution, or we're going to just let ourselves continue to say, well, one day we're going to wake up and we're going to be 50th. So, you all have the report on your tables, and this is one of the first official sessions of this conference. So you are now equipped to go out and speak to legislators who conveniently have a little ribbon that identifies them <laughs> on their name card. Yeah. The, yeah. We, we, we low jacked them all. <laughs> and, and there's a low jack on your app. So there, you know, consult your app and you will find the nearest legislator to you in the room. So let's thank the panel for their candor. for the remarkable work of the coalition. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mary. <laughs>